This conference will now be recorded. So we are seeing the part two of temporal infratemporal region, muscles of mastication. So you know what are the muscles of mastication. So the principal muscles of mastication are temporalis muscle, mainly the temporalis muscle, masseter, lateral pterygoid, and medial pterygoid. Okay. So what are the special features of muscles of mastication? So all are derived from the first arch and it is supplied by common now. So that is the uh, phi three. It is a third division of the trigem now that is mandibular now supplies all the four muscles and it helps in the movement of the temporomandibular joint. So other than this, uh, all the muscles have the common insertion into the uh, mandible. So these are the special features of muscles of mastigation. And if you see the accessory muscles of mastigation, they are digastric, vaccinator, mylohyoid, and geniohyoid. Okay. So these are the accessory muscles. The principal muscles are four muscle, temporalis, lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, and masseter. And accessory muscles are digastric, vaccinator, mylohyoid, and geniohyoid. Okay, so this vaccinator is muscle of the face. Other three muscles are present uh, in the neck. It is uh, mainly uh, they are attached to the hyoid bone. Okay, so with this we'll continue into the uh, principal muscles. First we'll see about the temporalis muscle. So you can see in this picture, this is the temporalis muscle. It's a fan-shaped muscle located in the temporal fossa. So the origin is from temporal fossa, but if you see insert, its insertion into the infratemporal fossa. So you can see it is covered by the temporal fascia and the temporal fossa. So as I said uh, yesterday, temporal fascia uh, is above attached to superior temporal line below to the zygomatic arch, but this temporalis will extend into the infratemporal fossa. If you see the origin of temporalis muscle, so it arises from inferior temporal line and the entire bone of the temporal fossa excluding the zygomatic bone here and it also arises from the temporal fascia okay so these are the origins of temporalis muscle so after its origin if you see you can see three types of fibers here this is the anterior fibers it is oriented vertically downwards and this is the middle fiber which is oriented obliquely and this is the posterior fibers which are oriented horizontally okay so it forms a fan shaped uh, uh, structure and uh, in the lower part it appears as tendinous and the tendinous part gets inserted into the tip and the anterior border and the medial surface of the coronoid process so this is the mandible and this is the coronoid process so it is attached to the tip anterior border and medial surface of coronoid process so other than this, this uh, insertion will even extend into the anterior border of the ramus of mandible up to the last molar teeth. Your last molar teeth will be here. So the ex uh, insertion will extend up to the last molar teeth. Okay. So we have finished the origin and insertion. Next we will go on to the so next part of the uh, temporalis muscle. So that is the uh, action of the temporalis muscle. So if you see, uh, I said three types of fibers based on the orientation. So we, the anterior and middle fibers, they help in the elevation of the mandible. Since the muscles are attached to the mandible, it is the only movable uh, bone in the skull and uh, it helps in the elevation of the mandible. So other than this, it also helps in side to side grinding movement. And the posterior fibers, if you see, it helps in the retraction of the mandible. Okay, so this is the these are the principal actions of the temporalis muscle. Okay, so if you see the now supply of temporalis muscles, this is supplied by deep temporal nerve. There are two deep temporal nerves, so which arises from the anterior division of the mandible. You can see the mandibular nerve. So the anterior division of mandibular nerve used to deep temporal nerve, which supplies the temporalis muscle from its deep surface. So this deep temporal nerve will be seen only after the removal of the temporalis muscle, not on the superficial surface. Okay. I think you're clear about the nerve supply of temporalis muscle. 
So next we'll go on to the relations of the temporalis muscle. So if you, you know, while reading the relations, we have to read both the superficial and deep relation. So you can see the superficial relation here. So first of all, it is covered by skin, that is scalp, okay, and the connective tissue, that is the second layer of the scalp. And next you have the auricularis muscle here, that is anterior and superior muscle. The fourth one will be your temporal fascia. So these are the four superficial structures. Other than this, so you will have the superficial temporal vessels and auriculotemporal nerve, and you have the zygomatic arch also, a part of mesiter muscle also will be related superficially. And in addition, you have a zygomatic temporal nerve here. Okay. So these are the superficial relations of temporalis muscle. Okay. Then if you go to the deep relation, before going into the deep relation, just see this picture and orient. So in this, actually this is the ramus of the mandible. So this is the lateral surface of ramus of mandible. So where the mesiter muscle is attached. So here the mesiter muscle is removed. You can see the coronoid process and the condyla process of mandible and you can see the zygomatic arch. Now, if you want to read the deep relation of temporalis muscle, you have to cut the zygomatic arch. So we have to put a cut here, one in the front and another behind in front of the external acoustic meatus and you have to remove the uh, zygomatic arch like this. Uh, you can see the uh, zygomatic arch is removed. Then next thing what you have to do is, so you put a cut uh, on the coronoid process here and another cut near just below the neck of the mandible. Then you reflect the tendon of the temporalis muscle upwards. Okay. So after reflecting that, you can see the deep relation of temporalis muscle. So the first thing, what do you see is the plexus of vein. They are called pterygoid plexus of vein. So this is the first deep relation of the temporalis muscle. Then after removing the pterygoid plexus of vein, you can see the maxillary artery and its branches. Okay. So this is the external carotid artery. Okay. So these are the two terminal branches of external carotid. One is the maxillary artery and here is the superficial temporal artery. So the maxillary artery lies in the infratemporal closer, which forms an a deep relation of temporalis muscle. And it's two branches. It gives so many branches. Only two branches are related to temporalis muscle. So the two anterior and posterior artery will be the, you can see this is the buccal artery. So this is the buccinator muscle. So buccinator muscle is uh, not supplied by buccal artery. Uh, this artery will supply the buccinator muscle. But buccal now, is a sensory nerve. It does not supply the vaccinator muscle. The vaccinator muscle is supplied by fascia. Okay. I think now you are clear. So after removing the maxillary artery, you can see the muscle. So lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid. So these are the two muscles related deeply to the temporalis muscle. Okay. Then after you uh, remove the medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid, you can see the mandibular nerve. So the mandibular nerve and its branch. This also forms the deep relations of temporalis muscle. Okay, so uh, deep relations, one, once again I am repeating. So the first one will be the pterygoid plexus of vein. The next one will be the maxillary artery and its few branches. That is deep temporal artery and buccal artery. The next one will be the lateral pterygoid muscle, medial pterygoid muscle. The next one will be the mandibular nerve and its branches. Okay, so that's all about the deep relations of the temporalis muscle. So with this, um, I'll finish the temporalis muscle. Next, I'll go on to the next muscle of the uh, mastication, that is mesiter muscle. So in the Greek, mesiter is called as a chewier. Okay, see the mesiter muscle here. So it is a quadrilateral shaped muscle. So covering the lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible, including its coronoid process. It does not cover the condyla process. It only covers the coronoid process. So this muscle has three layers, superficial layer. You can see the superficial layer, which is very thick. But um, beneath this, you have the middle layer. That's why it looks thick. And you can see the deep layer separately on the posterior aspect of the superficial. So there are three layers, superficial, middle, and deep layer. Okay. 
So next we'll go on to the origin of the masseter muscle. So all together, this masseter muscle arises from the zygomatic arch. Okay, and the maxillary process. Of, this is the zygomatic bone. So this um, process here. So this is the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone. So from the deep surface of maxillary uh, process of zygomatic bone, it arises. But if you see the different layer, the superficial layer only it arises from the maxillary process of zygomatic bone and anterior two third of the lower margin of zygomatic arch. The middle layer arises from the posterior one third of the lower margin of zygomatic arch. The deep layer arises from the deep surface of the zygomatic arch. Okay, so uh, actually the muscle of mastication is an important essay question. So all this muscles will be asked separately in five mark question. So if they are asking in five mark question, you have to write layer by layer. If they are asking in one mark question, you can write simply it arises from zygomatic arch and from maxillary process. But if it is asked in five mark question, you have to write all the three layers and its separate origin. Okay. So I think you, now you are clear about the origin of the masseter. Next, we'll go on to the insertion. So now here the masseter is removed. You can tra see the traces of the masseter. So it is inserted into the lateral surface of the ramus of mandible and its angle this is the angle and even the upper part of the mandibular ramus and its coronoid process. So this part gives attachment to the meseta. Okay, so um, in short, the meseta gets inserted into the lateral surface of ramus of the mandible. Okay, and if you see the action, so the meseta is a strong muscle which helps in elevation of the mandible and helps in protraction of the mandible. Okay, so the temporalis also helps in retraction of the mandible. Posterior fibers helps in retraction. Okay, so the protraction is done by the meseta. Okay, so now you are, I think you are clear about the origin insertion. Next, we'll see about the nerve supply of the meseta. Okay. Here the meseta is uh, removed um, uh, partly here. You can see the mandibular notch between the coronoid process and the condylar process. Okay, this is the maxillary artery. Okay, uh, you can see a nerve is coming uh, from the infratemporal fossa to the deep surface of the meseta. So this nerve is called mesetric nerve. Okay, so it is a branch from the anterior division of the mandibular nerve. Okay, so this supplies the meseter muscle. Okay. Now we'll go on to the relations of the meseter. Okay, so while reading the relations, you have to read both superficial and deep relation. So we'll see the superficial relations of meseter. So the first relation here is the parotid gland. So here the skin is removed, okay, and the superficial fascia is removed. You can see the parotid gland in the face in front of the auricle okay and uh, you can see the meseter muscle here. this is the meseter muscle here so from the anterior border of the parotid gland you can see numerous nerves emerging these are nothing but the branches of the facial nerve so this is also related superficial to meseter the next thing you can see a green color structure this is the parotid duct which emerges from the parotid gland and you can see between the meseter and this muscle is buccinator. So between this you have the buccal pad of fat, so which separates the anterior border of meseter from the buccinator muscle. Okay, so this buccal pad of fat is a, again related superficially to meseter. Okay, so the entire meseter along with parotid gland is covered with the fascia that is called parotidomesetric fascia that is nothing but an extension of the deep cervical fascia. I think now you are clear about the superficial relations of the meseter. So the deep relation, nothing to mention because it is directly related to the lateral surface of ramus of mandible and the tendon of the temporalis. Okay, so that's all about the meseter muscle. Next, we'll go on to the lateral pterygoid muscle. I think you are clear up to this. Okay, so I'm going to continue with the lateral pterygoid muscle. So now everything is removed the zygomatic arch is removed coronoid process is removed a part of ramus also removed here mandibular nerve is removed maxillary artery is removed now you can clearly see the lateral pterygoid muscle which is a key muscle of the infratemporal region if you see the shape it is a, 
conical shaped muscle with its apex pointing backwards towards the joint okay temporomandibular joint and it's a short muscle and it's a thick muscle also if you see the direction it passes backwards and slightly laterally from the roof and the medial wall of the infratemporal fossa to the neck of the mandible okay so it consists of two heads upper head lower head okay so the lateral pterygoid muscle consists of two heads upper head and the lower head okay so now before going into the origin of the lateral pterygoid muscle we'll have a short review of the sphenoid bone and mandible which is related to the origin and insertion okay so this bone is the mandible okay the colored part here is the coronoid process and here is the condyla process so you can see in front of the condyla this is the neck of the mandible so you can see a depression in front of the neck of the mandible this depression is called pterygoid fovea and this notch is the mandibular notch and you can see inside the ramus you can see a foramen this is the mandibular foramen and this projection is the lingula and you can see a groove here this is called the mylohyoid groove okay so clear about the mandible next we'll go on to the sphenoid bone so this is the inferior inferior view of the skull that green colored bone is the inferior view of the sphenoid bone okay here you can see the hard palate okay so this is the maxilla and this is the zygomatic arch you can see so this is the sphenoid bone this part is the temporal bone now see the mark part this part is called as the infratemporal crust which separates the temporal fossa from the infratemporal fossa okay so this is called infratemporal crust and this is the pterygo maxillary fissure and this is the inferior orbital fissure okay now this surface is called the infratemporal surface of greater wing of sphenoid which forms the roof of infratemporal fossa okay and you can see the pterygoid process here which has the lateral pterygoid plate and medial pterygoid plate the lateral pterygoid plate has medial surface and this surface on the lateral side is the lateral surface and you can see two foramens here foramen ovae and foramen sphenoid i think you are clear with this i'll go on to the origin of the lateral pterygoid so i have said it has two heads so upper head and the lower head upper head is small okay so it arises from the infratemporal crest and the infratemporal surface of greater wing of sphenoid okay and if you see the lower head the lower larger head it arises from the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone okay so you are clear now okay. so it has two head upper head small lower head large upper head arises from infratemporal crest and infratemporal surface of greater wing of sphenoid lower head arises from the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate of sphenoid okay so next we'll go on to the insertion before going into the insertion see here the lateral pterygoid muscle is removed and the lateral pterygoid plate is shown okay so from the lateral surface of lateral pterygoid plate lateral pterygoid muscle arises from the medial surface medial pterygoid muscle arises so the two surfaces is giving origin to two different muscle lateral surface gives origin to lateral pterygoid medial surface gives origin to medial pterygoid muscle so that's why the lateral pterygoid plate is called as muscle plate okay so now we'll go on to the insertion of the lateral pterygoid muscle so the upper head and the lower head is directed backwards and it gets inserted into the pterygoid fovea on the front of the neck of the mandible and it also gains attached to the articular disc of the temporomandibular joint and even to the capsule of the temporomandibular joint okay so the lateral pterygoid muscle gets inserted into pterygoid fovea articular disc and capsule of the temporomandibular joint so the the articular disc is nothing but the and extension of the lateral pterygoid muscle so this is the one mcq question yesterday i have asked in test i think how many of you have answered i don't know okay so next we'll go on to the nerve supply of lateral pterygoid so the lateral pterygoid is supplied by a branch from the anterior division of mandibular nerve so that branch is called pterygoid branch okay so it is nothing but a branch of the mandibular nerve 
okay so i think you are clear about the nerve supply so it is supplied by again a mandibular nerve okay so next we will go on to the uh, next action of the lateral pterygoid muscle so if you see the actions of lateral pterygoid muscle okay so it depresses the mandible it is the only depressor of the mandible all other three muscles are elevators of the mandible but this if you see the lateral pterygoid it is depresses the mandible that means it opens the mouth by pulling forward the condylar process of mandible and articular disc of the temporomandibular jaw okay so you can see the contraction of the lateral pterygoid muscle and it pulls forward the condylar process and articular disc okay so the next action will be the protrusion of the mandible that is done both by the lateral and medial pterygoid both will contract together and do the protrusion of the mandible okay that means bringing forward the mandible that is called protrusion bringing backward is that is bringing backward from the protrusion portion is called the retraction okay so now other than this along with medial pterygoid it also helps in side to side movement that is helps in chewing action okay so you can see the lateral movement to right side that is done by left um, lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid and you can see in this picture lateral movement to left side that is done by right pterygoid okay so clear about the actions of lateral pterygoid so the main action is it is the only depressor of the mandible it is also assisted assisted by other muscles okay and other than this it helps in protraction of the mandible and side to side movement of the lower jaw as in chewing now we'll go on to the relations of the lateral pterygoid first we'll see the superficial relation lateral pterygoid muscle out of all four muscle lateral pterygoid is very very important muscle. okay so first we'll see the superficial relation so the first relation here is the ramus of the mandible okay so next will be the masseter we have removed the masseter here okay and the third one will be the tendon of the temporalis okay here we have removed the tendon of temporalis and the fourth one will be the medial pterygoid this is the medial this is the lateral pterygoid and this is the medial pterygoid muscle okay and the fifth relation will be again the maxillary artery and its temporal and mesenteric branches so these are the five superficial relation so the first one is the ramus of mandible second is masseter third one is tendon of temporalis fourth one is the medial pterygoid mainly the superficial head and the fifth one is the maxillary artery and its temporal and mesenteric now in this picture you can see the maxillary artery it rests on the lateral pterygoid muscle so actually the maxillary artery has three part first second and third part the second part will be either related um, uh, superficial to um, uh, lateral pterygoid or it will lie deep to the lateral pterygoid okay so next we'll go on to the deep relations of the lateral pterygoid we have removed the lateral pterygoid in this picture so now you can see the mandibular now okay with few branches here okay and you can see the middle meningeal artery which is a branch of the first part of maxillary artery which is also related to the deep part of lateral pterygoid and other than this you can see the spino mandibular ligament then you can see the deep head of the medial pterygoid muscle okay so i think you are clear about the deep relation mandibular now middle meningeal artery spino mandibular ligament and deep head of the medial pterygoid muscle okay then what are the other deep relation so you can see uh, this is a schematic diagram uh, which i have downloaded from the visham singh only you can refer the book okay now this is the lateral pterygoid muscle this is upper head and lower head you can see the maxillary artery so you can see the structures emerging from the upper border of the lateral pterygoid so what are the structures emerge at the upper border so one is the mesenteric now the next one will be the deep temporal now and arteries so this are the three structures which emerge at the upper border and you see the structures emerging at the lower border the first structure is the middle meningeal artery the next one will be the inferior alveolar nerve and artery and next one will be the lingual nerve okay so this are the four structures which emerge from the lower border of the lateral pterygoid muscle okay and in between the two head 
So what are the structures is passing? Structure passing through the gap between two heads there are two structure. One is the maxillary artery, other one is the buccal nerve. So the maxillary artery it passes between the two head and enter the pterygo maxillary fissure and it continues as a third part of maxillary artery. I think now you are clear about the relations of the lateral pterygoid. Okay. So any doubt in this part? I'll continue with the next muscle that is the medial pterygoid. So the medial pterygoid is again a deep muscle. It is also a thick quadrilateral muscle. It consists of two head, superficial head and deep head. The deep head lies deep to the lower head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Okay, you can see the medial pterygoid muscle here. The ramus is removed. So you can see the superficial head and the deep head. Okay. So if you see the origin of the medial pterygoid muscle, so you have to read in two parts. So first we'll see the superficial head. The superficial head, it's a small slip of muscle. So it arises from the maxillary tuberosity. It is a part behind the third molar tooth in the maxilla. And it also arises from the lateral surface of pyramidal process of the palatine bone, which is located here. Okay. And if you see the deep head, the deep head arises from medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. So as I already said, the lateral pterygoid plate, lateral surface gives origin to lateral pterygoid. Medial surface gives origin to the deep head of medial pterygoid muscle. And also the adjoining surface of the pyramidal process of palatine bone also gives origin to larger deep head. So I think you are clear about the origin, two head superficial head which is very small, large, deep head, which, okay, superficial head arises from maxillary tuberosity, large, deep head arises from the medial surface of lateral pterygoid plate, okay. So next we'll go on to the insertion. So it is inserted into the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible. You can see the posterior view of the uh, skull, uh, okay, after removing all the structures here. You can see it is inserted into the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible and even gets inserted into the angle. So below and behind the mandibular foramen and mylohyoid groove. Okay. So this is the insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle. Okay. So next we'll go on to the nerve supply. So it is supplied by a branch derived from the trunk of the mandibular. Actually the mandibular now uh, it is divided into two division, anterior and posterior division. So all other muscles are supplied by anterior division of mandibular. No? This is the only muscle which is supplied by the trunk of the mandibular. Okay. So you can see the trunk, this supplies the medial pterygoid muscle here. Okay. So next we'll go on to the actions. So it also helps in elevation of mandible in combination of uh, with the lateral pterygoid, it helps in protrusion and side to side chewing movements of the mandible. So, both actions of lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid are similar except so lateral pterygoid is a depressor, medial pterygoid is an elevator. So, elevators of the mandible are temporalis, meseter, and medial pterygoid. Depressor is lateral pterygoid. So, protrusion is done by all other muscles except temporalis. Okay. So the posterior fibers of temporalis helps in retraction of the mandible. Okay. So I think you are clear about the actions. Next we'll go on to the relations of the medial pterygoid. Okay. So actually uh, if you see the relation. So this is the ramus of the mandible and here is the lateral surface. So the ramus of the mandible is separated from medial pterygoid by all the structure. You have to understand in this point. So this is the ramus and this is the muscle. In between these two, you have a lot of structure. So that form the superficial relation of the medial pterygoid. So the first muscle will be, the first structure will be the lateral pterygoid muscle. And you can uh, see the other structures, okay? That is the, you can see the inferior alveolar nerves and vessels and spinomandibular ligament and lingual nerve, okay? So these are the, four structures you can see in between the medial pterygoid and ramus. One is lateral pterygoid muscle. So next is inferior alveolar vessels and now spinomandibular ligament and lingual nerve. 
the sphenomandibular ligament is attached between the spine of the sphenoid and the lingula of the mandible okay which is lingula is located above the mandibular foramen okay now we'll see the other relations so you can see the maxillary artery and even a portion of the parotid gland is related to the medial pterygoid muscle okay so i think you are clear about the lateral surface relations of the medial pterygoid next we'll go on to the medial surface so the medial surface is the uh, actually the deep relation of the medial nerve so what are the deep relation so you can see the lateral pterygoid plate here this is the superficial head and the deep head so deep to the deep head of medial pterygoid you can see two muscles which is arising from the um pterygoid uh, hamulus okay and uh, from the um, hot palate and you can see two muscles which is this muscles are the muscles of soft palate they are nothing but the tensor villi palatine and levator villi palatine okay so palatinae that means it belongs to palate muscle helps in the action of tension of the palate and elevation that is elevation of the palate so other than this you can see the styloglossus and stylopharyngeus muscle so which passes deep to the medial pterygoid muscle styloglossus goes to the tongue stylopharyngeus goes to the pharynx and next muscle is the superior constrictor which is the muscle of the again pharynx so these are the deep relations of medial pterygoid okay so i think you are clear about the relation we'll go on to the next applied anatomy so how will you test the muscle that means you are testing the mandibular not the muscle okay so you have to uh, ask the patient to clench his teeth repeatedly and you have to palpate the temporalis and masseter in the temporal fossa so if the muscle is contracting means then the nerve is active okay so if it is not contracting means then the some um, uh, lesion related to the nerve okay so next clinical condition related to the masseter muscle is the trismus so the trismus is called as locked jaw so what is locked jaw okay you cannot close the mouth okay uh, some part actually it is uh, uh, kept wide open so if you see the normal mouth opening will be 35 mm and larger okay at in trismus what happened the mouth opening will be only 35 mm okay you cannot open the mouth uh, um widely because uh, there will be spasm of the both the masseter so which is a characteristic symptom of the tetanus okay so if the mouth opening is smaller than 35 then this condition is called trismus so this is called locked jaw that means you cannot open the mouth widely okay a smaller part you can open so how will you test this locked jaw you have to admit your three fingers into the mouth if the three fingers is passing inside then it is normal if it is not admitting the three fingers then this condition is called trismus so even you can measure with the help of the scale if it is less than 35 mm then it is trismus so actually um this uh, trismus is caused by the uh, tetanus toxin if you uh, wounded with any other um, uh, that is metals if you are uh, left untreated you are not taking a tt injection so this tetanus toxin will affect mainly the muscles okay skeletal muscles so which results in chronic contraction of all the skeletal muscles so this uh, actually um, causes the tonic spasm of masseter helps in the locked jaw okay so i think that's all about the applied aspect now i'll summarize whatever so far i have taken there are four muscles of principal muscles of mastication temporalis masseter lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid okay so lateral pterygoid muscle is the only depressor remaining all other muscles are elevator and the temporalis posterior fibers helps in the retraction all other muscles helps in protraction and the masseter lateral pterygoid medial pterygoid they helps in the chewing of the mandible okay so with this i'll finish the class so okay um do you have any doubt in this